Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible study is going to be on why God deceives. Now, people think, oh, well, God just deceives unbelievers. But that's not true. Sometimes God deceives people that believe in him, or at least people that say they believe on him. Let's take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. When are we gathered? Well, the common term in the church circles is the rapture. Okay? Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The second coming. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. You know, it's interesting. The uh, people that promote the pre-trib rapture say, well, you know, it could happen any moment now. There's nothing that has to happen before the rapture happens, as they call it. Well, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 just said, For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that's now, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That right there tells you, until the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, and this is Paul's words, John called him the Antichrist, uh, John, in the book of Revelation, calls him the beast. So, to me, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast, is the same entity. So this tells you right here, the gathering together, the rapture, if you want to call it that, is not going to happen until there's a falling away first, and the man of sin is going to be revealed, the son of perdition. So, this right there just blows the pre-trib rapture imminence, imminence doctrine down to hell where it belongs. For that day shall not come except there come up falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, if this didn't happen in 70 A.D., when Rome came and destroyed the temple, a matter of fact, Rome destroyed the temple on the same exact day that the Babylonians came and destroyed the first temple. Coincidence? 365 days in a year? That's a 1 in 365 chance. And, bo and, it, and both times, God sent the Jews a message about their temple. So if it didn't happen in 70 AD, that means there's going to have to be another temple. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. What's the mystery of iniquity? Personally, I believe it is the serpent seed doctrine. 
And I have an entire playlist on Genesis 6 about this thing. There are people that think that it, the sin of Eve in the Garden of Eden was sexual with Satan. And you know what? If the fallen angels in Genesis 6 can do that, why couldn't Satan do it? I mean, after all, the Bible says it's, uh, what is it, in Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel, I forget which one, said he was lifted up in pride because of his beauty. Why wouldn't Eve want to have the most beautiful angel that God probably ever created? I mean, people say, oh, well, that's, that's impossible. Really? I got a playlist on Genesis 6, the giants, the sons of God, about maybe 12, 15 hours. Don't tell me it's not possible. You know, you'll probably find one day that over half of all the preachers are possessed of devils. And I'm not talking about the people on TBN. I'm not talking about Benny Hinn and those kind of people. I'm talking about independent, fundamental, King James, Bible-believing, independent Baptist churches that teach all this stuff. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. You know, how in the world did this get fulfilled in 70 AD? Did the Romans have power and signs and lying wonders? No. So preterists are, you know, when you show stuff to preterists, I've noticed, I think God deceives them because they dishonor his son. When they say, oh, well, you know, that that's figuratively. That's their answer to everything in the book of Revelation. When you show them, oh, well, when did the sea turn red from blood uh, to blood and all the fish die? Oh, well, that's figuratively. What? When did a quarter of the Earth's population die? Oh, well, that's figuratively. You know, er everything, they just explain it away. So, so, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, all power and signs and lying wonders. I don't think that happened in 70 AD. Verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Hmm. God sends them the strong delusion. God. Now this kind of ties in with it. Revelation chapter 12. And there was war in heaven. Past tense. I think the war in heaven happened sometime after God created the earth. Perhaps after he had created Adam. Why do I say that? Now, please understand, I'm not a know-it-all. I don't have, have it all figured out. I mean, you know, let's face it. The disciples asked Jesus when he was going to return, and he didn't even know. 
He said, only the Father knows. The angels in heaven don't know. Only Father knows. Only God the Father. So, you know, if there's things that Jesus doesn't know, I guarantee you there's a lot of things that I don't know. So, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, it says, um, now this is after God had made everything, okay? He had made the earth, he'd made the creatures, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything. And God saw everything that he had made. And that includes everything. The angels, the earth, the sun, Adam. Okay? And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, there's people that believe that there was a earth age before this, and yeah, they make some interesting points, and, and I can't say they're wrong or they're right, but that one verse right there makes me wonder, you know, maybe, maybe there was an earth age before this, or maybe there wasn't, I don't know. You know, they make some good points, and I can't refute it with one verse. I can't do it. So, I say that the fallen angels had to fall after Adam and Eve were created, after God had created everything, because he said everything's good, right? But I think this war in heaven was in the past, because after all, why would God uh, have Adam and Eve in the garden and then Satan's walking, well, a serpent in the garden? If you don't know who the serpent in the garden was, well, I'm going to tell you right now who the serpent is. It wasn't a talking snake hanging from an apple tree. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Hmm, why is it an old serpent? Because it had been around for a long time. You know, when you read Genesis 3 about the serpent that was speaking to Eve, what do you think, you know, what do you think of? And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, which deceiveth the whole world. Sometimes the devil deceives people in one to varying degrees. Everybody in the world is deceived of Satan to one degree or another, and that includes me. I know it. I know there's a lot of things I probably don't know. There's probably some things that I teach that are wrong, but Lord knows I'm not doing it on purpose. Like, uh, you want to see people teaching things, lies, turn on TBN, you'll see it. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So sometimes, well, sometimes God deceives and you got Satan that deceives. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse oh, 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Ah. You see, I don't think God deceives people that try to live in righteousness. And I'm not talking about our righteousness. Our righteousness is in Christ. Let's face it, people. Uh, 
you know, when the Lord asked me, well, why should I let you into heaven? I'm not going to say, oh, because I did Bible studies. No, 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 no. No, it's because of what your son did on the cross, Lord. That's, that's why. Not because of anything I did or can do. You know? And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Bingo! That's why you got so many people running around on these Christian websites telling Christians they're stupid and atheism's the way to go. It's, they believe in God. Of course they do. They, but they don't want people to follow God's laws, which are righteous. And people get confused. You have the Ten Commandments that were the moral laws for everybody, which Christ boiled down to the two commandments, love the Lord and love thy neighbor. Then you had the tribe of Levi that did the animal blood sacrifices. Well, those laws were indeed nailed to the cross. We don't need to sacrifice a sheep anymore. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world when he saw Jesus. The Levitical laws were done away with. But then you got the laws of the king, and that was David. And those laws were to punish evildoers. You know, the Bible said that murderers should be put to death at the mouth of two or three witnesses. And if people committed perjury and lied to have somebody put to death, they were to be put to death. And let me tell you something. You'd think long and hard before you lied because they caught you in a lie whatever you thought to do to the other person would happen to you and there wasn't no appeals to a superior court or the supreme court no no that they so there are three distinct laws the individual laws the sacrificial laws by the priests, the Levites, tribe of Levi, and then the king, which was the civil law. The laws of blood sacrifice were considered the ecclesial, ecclesiastical laws. So, all right. So you got people that have pleasure in unrighteousness that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Oh my God. Paul's talking about election here. That's horrible, isn't it? If you go to a free will Baptist church, they'll say, oh, no, 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 that's, 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 that's not, that's wrong. But the, the Bible says right here, God hath chosen you because God hath from the beginning, from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Do you believe that Christians are a chosen people? I do. Absolutely. Absolutely I believe Christians are the God's chosen people. Jesus said, my sheep, hear my voice. Verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Epistle's just a letter. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which have loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. You know what grace is? It's unmerited favor. You're walking down the street and you see some guy that's 
you know, looks like he hasn't taken a bath and, and raggedy clothes. And, you know, maybe you find out the guy had lost his job and got thrown out of his apartment and you slip him a $50 bill. That's grace. That's an unmerited favor. Well, that's what God did to us. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Wow. Why would Paul say something about work? Because you know what? Good works follow true faith. You don't get saved because of good works. You do good works because you are saved. That's the way it works. All right, remember I told you uh, that Satan was beautiful? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Now, is this a human king? Or is this or is Satan being called the king of Tyrus? Hmm, let's take a look. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum of full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Wait a minute, that old serpent. You know, the, the, the talking snake that was hanging from the apple tree? Hmm, that Eve bit on? Yeah. When was a, a human king of Tyrus, how old would he had to have been to to have been in the Garden of Eden. Hmm. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. I'll guarantee you the king of Tyrus was born, not created. Adam was created. Think about that. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. You know what an anointed cherub was? You know what it meant to be anointed? God had his prophets take oil and anoint or pour oil upon the heads of the kings to anoint them. The, whole, uh, the oil being uh, symbolic of God's spirit. So that, you know, let's face it, King Solomon, when God asked him, what did, you know, what do you want? He says, I'm going to, to rule these people, I'm going to need wisdom. And, and God was really impressed. Of course, he probably, I'm sure he knew but uh, he says, well, because you didn't ask for the lives of your enemies, because you didn't ask for gold and silver and wealth, I'm going to give you everything and wisdom. He says, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Covered what? God's throne. Do you realize Satan, before he became Satan, he was the anointed cherub that covered God's throne? Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee, though 
Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And people will tell you, oh, this is the king of Tyrus. He's a human. They lie. I'm telling you, people. I, I bet you, you know, not lottery bet, but I'm willing to put forth my belief, I should say, you're going to find out that probably over half the preachers in this country are possessed of devils. Thou, and they lie. That's what they do. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity. Iniquity is evil and wickedness. Till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst, midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned. There was war in heaven, people. Didn't we just read that in Revelation 12? Satan tried to kill God himself. Is that stupid or what? I mean, I've done some really stupid things, but uh, I think that takes the cake. By the multitude that I merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. Mm. Didn't the Bible say that Satan was cast out into the earth? Now this is the Old Testament, people. You know, people will point to Revelation and say, well, that's the future. This is Ezekiel. This is the past. This is the Old Testament. This is several hundred years before Christ was even born on this earth. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes, ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee, Thou shalt be a terror, and sh never shalt thou be any more. You know, when I read this, I think God's going to burn up, burn them up, and that's it, gone. You know, a lot of people don't realize it. The reason the Lord deceives people is because they don't honor him. You got that right. They don't honor him. In Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8, Jesus said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And that's the problem. Now, let's take a look at what happens when somebody doesn't honor the Lord more than their family. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 2. I guess we're going to read probably read the whole chapter. Verse 1. Now, there was a woman named Hannah, and she didn't have any children. And she promised the Lord that if she had a child, she'd dedicate it to the Lord. Now, obviously, Hannah was a, a godly woman, and God honored her request. So she gave her child to the priest. 
Now let's read. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. Now that right there, when you read about the horns in Revelation, right here is giving you a hint at what a horn means. My heart rejoiceth in the Lord, mine horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Hmm. You know, the Bible says, and that rock was Christ. Did you know that? Let's take a look. Now, I know that those of you that have listened to me for quite a while, a lot of this stuff that I'm, you know, I'm teaching on, you know, you've heard it before, but, you know, I get new listeners and, you know, sometimes you need to hear something several times before it really sinks in. Um, you know, I went to college and I noticed when the teacher mentioned something two or three times, I knew that was going to be on the test. I knew it was going to be important. Well, guess what? Uh, there's a lot of things that the preachers teach that are lies. They're deceiving people. And they're doing it on purpose. You know, it's just, it's sad. Now this one uh, sinks the, uh, the Catholic Church with their Peter is the rock doctrine. Oh yes, God, uh, P, uh, Jesus made Peter the rock and he went to Rome and founded the church. They'll tell you. Well, where in the Bible does it say that Peter went to Rome? It doesn't. Paul went to Rome. The Bible records that. Peter, oh, well, that's just tradition and legend. That's their, you know, their thing. That's what the, the Catholics teach. Um, it's not in the Bible. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, Corinthians, the Corinthians were a, was a city in Greece. And <laughs> there was a cloud and they passed through the Red Sea. You know, if you've never read the book of Exodus, you'd, you'd be like, what are they talking about here? Verse 2. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. What? The manna. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Gee, uh, oh, gee uh, the Roman Catholics teach that Peter was the rock. Well, hey, argue with Paul. What can I tell you? But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Yeah, God wasn't happy with Israel. He had them wander for 40 years and they all died except for a handful of them. I think it was what, Joshua and Caleb? I think that was it. Now these things were our examples. To the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye. Do you know what murmuring means? It means complaining. God was feeding them in the wilderness with manna, and they said, Oh, 
I am so sick and tired of this manna. Day after day after day, manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner, manna, manna for midnight snack. I am so sick of manna. That's murmuring. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Hmm. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my beloved, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. And you know what? That's going to happen one day. The book of Revelation even says that uh, there's going to be an image of the beast, and those that won't worship it would be put to death. Show that to a preterist that says that everything was fulfilled in 70 AD, except for Christ returning. You see, people, their Christ is returning. He's called the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist. They're going to be deceived. The preterists are going to be deceived. And God's going to deceive them, or Satan, I don't know. How do you like to be deceived by both God and Satan? You, you ain't got a chance. Not a chance. Not a snowball's chance in hell, right? As they would say in the world. I know there's a lot of people in hell that would like to have a snowball. But it ain't going to happen. The rich man asked Abraham to let Lazarus come and put a drop of water on his tongue. He said, for I am tormented in this flame. Abraham replied, there's a great gulf between us and we can't go to you and you can't come to us. Think about it. In the 13th chapter of Revelation, verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Basically, idol in the Hebrew is a direct correlation to the image in the Greek. I mean, let's face it, an idol is an object and an image is an object. I mean, you're looking at something. Uh, every time I read this, I always thought of television. Did this happen in 70 AD? No, not that I know of. When did, when did they, they, they give life to an image of a beast? And the image of the beast both spoke and caused people that wouldn't worship the image of the beast to be killed. It never happened in 70 A.D. Preterists look at this and say, well, that's figuratively. How in, the, how in the world can this be figuratively? How? I mean, it's right there in black and white. Well, unless you got a, you know, unless you got a, a Bible with the uh, words of Christ in red, then it would be black and white and sometimes red, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. Wherefore, my beloved, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. You think people are going to listen to that when the image of the beast comes? They're going to think, oh, even Christ has come. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? 
For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel, after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered and sacrificed to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. They sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You know what happens when you drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils? You get an upset stomach. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Satan tried that. It didn't work, did it? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no questions for the conscience sake. Do you know what a shambles is? It's a market. So, you ever been to a market, uh, an outdoor market place? You know, like a flea market? Well, that's a shambles. You look around, it's a shambles. There's no order. Everything's all over the place. You ever go to your kid's room when they were young, playing with all their toys all over the floor? You say, oh, boy, that's a shambles. Well, pff, there you go. And they'll tell you, oh, well, the King James Bible, it's so much harder than the new modern versions. No, it's not. No, it's not. Whatever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And guess what, people? Even if they build a temple for the Antichrist, it still belongs to the Lord. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them but believe not, bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other, for why is my liberty judge of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whether, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. All right, let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread. In other words, the, the people that were rich, uh, they lost everything, and now they're uh, becoming other people's servants just to feed themselves. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. 
Hmm. Remember Lazarus? And people will tell you that Jesus isn't God in the flesh. What? You know, uh, the Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. Do you know that Jesus went to Abraham's bosom for three days, preached in hell, and took all the Old Testament saints and brought them up? He was raised from the dead on the third day. I did a Bible study on that. You should listen to it. It's interesting. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set him to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. Ooh. For by strength shall no man prevail. You know, what ties right in to that, in my opinion, is Matthew chapter 25, verse 28. Uh, there was a... Uh, the king gave a talent, which was like money, to his servants, and some of them increased what they were given. But one did nothing with his talent and buried it in the ground. So what did they, uh, so when the king returned, some people had gained 10, some people had gained five, but this one guy did nothing. He was afraid. He hid his talent. And when the Lord came back, he gave him back what he, you know, gave him. What did Jesus say? Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, this person was a servant of the king, but he was unprofitable. He was good for nothing. And people, people will tell you that your works have absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. Well, you know, your works are not going to earn you salvation. But here, this guy was unprofitable. He was good for nothing. He gave the king back exactly what he was given. He didn't do anything with it. He didn't preach the gospel. He didn't do anything. Now, there's, everybody has a different sp spiritual gift. Everybody has, everybody that's born again of the Spirit has a spiritual gift. Every single one. I believe mine is teacher. But uh, he said, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory... And all the holy angels with him, not the unholy angels, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Hmm. First Samuel chapter 2, back to, let's see, verse 9. He, the Lord, he will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. And the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. 
You know, people, there is more prophecy in the Old Testament concerning the end times than there is in the New Testament, in my opinion. And people won't read it. Oh, well, that Old Testament, that's for the Jews. That doesn't apply to us. No, it's not. The Jews don't believe. Well, most of the people that call themselves Jews are not even Jews. They're if they speak Yiddish, chances are they're they're Chazars, K H A Z A R S or C H A Z A R S. Look it up in a Jewish encyclopedia. They were a people that converted to Judaism. I mean, do do you know who Sammy Davis Jr. is? Well, he he's a uh, was a black entertainer that converted to Judaism. You know. Uh, what can I tell you? You know, but uh, they don't speak Hebrew. They speak Yiddish, which is a made up, basically a made up language. And, uh, you know, that's the thing. They don't believe the Bible. They believe a book called the Talmud, which is, uh, Talmud means learning. Matter of fact, the correct title is called the Babylonian Talmud. So that means Babylonian learning or learning from Babylon. Think about that next time you hear about Mystery Babylon the Great. They also believe a book called the Zohar and the Kabbalah, which is witchcraft and Satanism masquerading as Judaism. And it's just amazing. And what do the churches do? They fawn all over these people like they're the chosen people of God. And, and then when you go to a church and you try telling people that Jesus condemned them over and over and over, called them hypocrites for their teachings from the Talmud, why, they call you an anti-Semite and kick you out of the church. I know, because they've done it to me many a times. I don't even go to church anymore. Why would I? It's not a, actually, it's not a church. It's, it's actually a, uh, what they call a 501c3 IRS-approved corporation, a business, masquerading as a church. So I, I've never been kicked out of church. I've been kicked out of businesses that are incorporated by the state approved by the IRS. And trust me, when the bank owns the the land, uh, the holds the mortgage for the land in the building, uh, what does the Bible say that the servant is, uh, that uh, the borrower is servant to the lender? So you better believe the banks tell these people what to preach. And when you know who owns the banks, they become God's chosen people. Oh, yeah. Let's go to John chapter 10, verse 23 through 29. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him, and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus, don't be beating around the bush. Don't be playing games with us. If you're the Christ, come out and say it. Tell us, I'm the Christ. Come on, tell us. If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you. And ye believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Should I repeat this for emphasis? But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep, Christians, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, 
and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My sheep hear my voice. Oh, yeah. All right, let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11. Uh, let's see. And Elkanah went to Remah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Okay, Eli was the priest at this time. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial, B-E-L-I-A-L. -E they knew not the Lord. Belial is uh, a word that basically means something worthless. It has reference to Satanism. When it says they were sons of Belial, it means they were a bunch of worthless Satan worshipers, basically. Verse 13. So Eli had sons. The priest of God had bad children that thought they were privileged. Verse 13. And the priest's customs with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he stuck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So did they in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth. But he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. So, this is the thing. In the Levitical book of Leviticus, the, the instructions for the, the priests, this is what they are, the Levites, they were supposed to burn the fat. Okay, but these guys are saying, nope, we ain't going to do it the Lord's way. We're going to do it my way. You're going to give me what I want now. And then I'm going to do my little ritual that the Lord requires. In other words, they were like Frank Sinatra. He, they did things my way, as he used to say. So either you're going to give it to me now, and if not, I'm going to take it by force. Verse 17, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Do you know what abhorred means? It means they hated it. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. Now Samuel was... Uh, Hannah, that was her prophecy that we read in the beginning, uh, that she had the child and gave it to Eli to raise and said that, you know, so Samuel became a, uh, a prophet and a priest. So, all right, so, uh, and Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed for this woman for the Lord, for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto their own house, unto their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the Lord Samuel grew before the Lord. And when it says that the Lord... And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. It just doesn't mean he, he got taller. It means he learned more about the Lord. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. Eli knew what his children were doing. He knew they were worthless children. 
He knew this. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. See, people, there's no new thing under the sun. And when it says when they laid with them, uh, take a guess what they were doing, okay? And uh, were they forcing the women? I don't know. And he, this is Eli, and Eli, uh, and he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this, by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Oh, yeah. If you sin against the Lord, who do you have for a defense attorney? Well, back in these days, before Christ came, you had nobody. You had nothing. All you had was an angry judge and a guilty verdict and judgment. Not pretty. You know, the Bible says that we have an advocate with the Father. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, lawyers were called an advocate. Uh, if, let's say, a friend of yours got in trouble with the law and they were trying to figure out what to do with him and he was your neighbor and, you know, you go before the judge and say, well, you know, Your Honor, I've known this guy for 25 years. He's been a good, outstanding citizen. He just fell into some hard times, made a stupid decision. We asked for leniency. Or a lawyer could do this. A matter of fact, a lawyer is called an advocate. That's an old English usage of a word. Uh, so if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, right? But Samuel's children had nothing. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Yep, don't listen to your, your dad. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And there came a man of God unto Eli. So here it is, a man of God comes unto Eli the priest, okay, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt, in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? You see, there were 12 tribes. Levi was one tribe, and God picked them to be the priest to serve the Lord. And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering? which I have commanded in my habitation, and honoreth and honoreth thy sons above me? Oh, yeah. Eli had more, was more worried about his children and their sin than he was about serving the Lord. You know, in Exodus 20, verse 12, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Hmm. Okay. Uh, 
in Luke 18, 20, Jesus said, Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. Hmm, okay. You know, in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, Jesus said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So guess what? Eli loved his children more than his service to the Lord, evidently. Back to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29. Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice at, and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honoreth thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that, that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honoreth me, I will honor. And them, I'm sorry, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. You know what? This is a very, very important verse. This is the whole, this is the crux of the entire point I'm trying to make with this Bible study. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me, for them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Hmm. Now here's an interesting verse. 1 John chapter 5 and starting in verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God, that's Christ, that's Jesus, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. You know what? Every Jew makes God a liar, according to this verse, if you believe the Bible. So how come churches are falling over backwards, telling you that unbelieving Jews are God's chosen people? Oh, that's right. It's not a church, it's a business, like I mentioned earlier. He that believeth on the Son hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. So you're going to tell me that God's chosen people don't have eternal life? And you're going to call them God's chosen people for what? For hell? God's chosen people for hell? These things have I written unto you that ye believe on the name of the Son of God. And that name is Jesus, not Yeshua HaMashiach that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. There you go, people. But now, the, let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, from them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me, shall be lightly esteemed. Let's take one more look at something. Let's go to the 8th chapter of John. You know what? Every church member should be, uh, well, everybody that believes the Bible should read this chapter. Now, obviously, it's not speaking of every, each and every single Jew, because a lot of the 
Jews in the uh, New Testament became Christians. They didn't call themselves Messianic Jews. John chapter 8, verse 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. Do you hear God's words? Ye, God, Jesus speaking to the Jews, ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews. Hmm, it's pretty obvious who he's talking to here, right? Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Ooh, they told Jesus, Oh, you're not a Jew, you're a Samaritan, and you've got a devil. You're possessed of a devil. Did you know that's the unpardonable sin? Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. Do you know the Jews dishonor Jesus? And what do the, these so-called churches do? They honor the people that dishonor Jesus. Should we honor the people that hate Jesus, that lie that say that he possessed of devils that he performed his miracles by the power of satan himself hmm let's go back to first samuel chapter 2 verse 30 wherefore the lord god of israel said saith i said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever but now the lord saith be it far from me for them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now God's going to pronounce judgment upon Eli. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. In other words, he's going to cut them down in their youth. And the man of thine whom... I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day shall they shall both die of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest, that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a piece of bread." All right, I've already gone well over an hour with the study, and you know what? I haven't even, I guess this is going to be a part one because I'm not even close to being done. So, well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. Um, and oh, by the way, I am on BitChute, B-I-T-C-H-U-T-E. You go there and look for Chaplain Bob Walker. Bob Walker, you know, and uh, you'll find me because one day YouTube's going to boot me off the air. YouTube's booting people off the air. Uh, they're getting copyright strikes, uh, community guideline strikes. If you knew what uh, France and Germany uh, and England are big time, big time having hate speech laws that are People can't even say what's true. I mean, if you were to say um, that, uh, if I were to say that, uh, I forget his name, but if uh, there was some Jewish guy that was head of a pornography uh, magazine, and I was to point that out, that could be booted off the air because that's hate speech. So, 
if I disappear from YouTube, go to B-I-T-C-H-U-T-E. Maybe I'll try to remember to put a link underneath in the description. But all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ, in his precious name. Amen.